Welcome everyone. Before we get started, I'll just draw your attention to our Zoom housekeeping. Very briefly, you are joining with your mute on. You can turn it off, but we do want to remind you to keep your mute on while you're not speaking. You can also test your audio using the audio settings option next to the microphone icon in your menu panel. Um, throughout the event, you can ask questions. You can submit written questions by clicking the chat icon. You can also ask a verbal question. Um, you can do that by using the raise hand feature, or you can turn on your video and raise your actual hand. Um, there's also some reference material um, that we recommend um, having a look at. You can search for these online. I will also provide the links in the chat box very shortly. Thanks so much for that uh, background, Jess. And good afternoon from Melbourne and good morning to others and welcome to this event today where we're launching the World Disasters Report for 2020. This year, the report's title is Come Heat or High Water, Tackling the Humanitarian Impacts of the Climate Crisis Together. We have an excellent panel with us today to discuss the findings of this key report, which is specifically addressing the humanitarian impacts of climate change in Australia, in the Asia Pacific and globally, and how we all have a responsibility to scale up effective action to reduce, prepare for and respond to these impacts. Before moving on, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land in which I'm speaking here in Melbourne, Australia, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, to acknowledge their deep link to this land and to value their Indigenous knowledge of weather and bushfire and to pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. I'm Fiona Tarpey, I'm the Head of International Advocacy at Australian Red Cross and I was also on the advisory board for this edition of the World Disasters Report. So I'm very pleased to be chairing this panel today. I also need to let you know that this panel is being recorded. But now I'd like to introduce this wonderful um, panel for discussion here today before outlining their biographies a bit more fully as we go throughout the session. Firstly, we have, we have Professor Martin Van Alst, who is um, the head of the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. Welcome, Martin. And thank you very much for joining us from um, the Netherlands um, at a unseemly hour in the morning. Pleasure. <laughs> hey. Uh, we have um, Viviana Zariel, who is um, from the Timor-Leste uh, Timor Red Cross. Hello, Viviana. Hello. Hello, welcome. Also from the Red Cross in Timor-Leste, we have Emidia uh, Bello. Hello, Emidia. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, based in Palau, in the North Pacific, we have Lamal Afamasaga. Hello to you, Lamal. Hello. And it's such a glorious setting there for you, Lamal. Welcome, we're all very jealous. <laughs> um, and finally, we have uh, Michael Lanier from the Australian Red Cross. Good afternoon, everybody. As a way of background, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent has produced its flagship World Disasters Report since 1993. Each edition analyzes important issues related to disaster risk management. In doing this, it brings together a wide range of policy and practice experts and commissions significant data analysis. And this report is no exception and is very data rich on climate and disaster trends and analysis. The Australian Red Cross with funding from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has been a long-term and very proud supporter of this publication. Including this year, we contributed case studies. And as I said, we participated on the advisory board which really enabled us to bring in our own experiences from Australia and from the region. So this year, the report has a very strong highlight and emphasis on how and why climate change is such a significant humanitarian issue, which we are seeing playing out in our region, you know, from bushfires in Australia to the hurricanes and back-to-back -back typhoons that are um, hitting Philippines and Vietnam over the last few weeks. As we see, disasters are not stopping or abating with the COVID-19 pandemic. And indeed, this report argues that the massive stimulus packages that are currently being developed and rolled out around the world in response to COVID-19 pandemic are an opportunity to build back better and for us all to address and reduce climate vulnerability and disaster risk. So the format of this session is for Professor Van Ols to present an overview of the report and its key findings. This will take about 10 minutes. Then we're over to the rest of the panel 
um, with a great diversity of experience there, to speak for a few minutes uh, around their experience of disasters and climate change from their re region. And then we'll move on to approximately 20 minutes of um, Q&A. And as Jess said, I really encourage you all to use the chat function here on Teams and, and feel free to post questions as well. You have a really great panel here to interrogate. Now to move more fully to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Martin, Martin Van Alst, who is someone I have had the pleasure of working with um, over many years. As I mentioned, uh, Martin is the head of the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. And the Climate Centre is a very impressive group of cl climate scientists many of whom are also very well versed in new forms of financing and innovation. Martin holds the Princess Marguerite Chair in Climate and Disaster Resilience at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Martin is also a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Indeed, he has a very impressive CV. So I'm very proud to hand over now to Martin for your overview of this report. Thanks so much, Fiona. And it's, uh, it's really nice to be with you this afternoon, morning for me indeed, um, to present this great report, which, which we're really proud of um, as a global Red Cross Red Crescent movement, but I think um, serves for discussions like we're having this morning all around the world around what we're facing in terms of uh, rising climate risks. And um, well, I was speaking to, to uh, the Secretary General of the IFRC yesterday who launched a report in Geneva and he was very happy with the reception, but at the same time, almost sad that um, the current circumstances make it have such a good reception. Uh, we're facing in Central America, the impacts of IOTA uh, on top of ADA, which arrived there two weeks ago. Uh, those are storms in the Greek alphabet because they've run out of names. Uh, and it's that compound effect that we're now also seeing in Asia, of course, with the Philippines and Vietnam also hit, hit by very powerful, uh, in some cases record uh, strong, but also successive storms. So uh, I think we're being confronted by the sort of challenges that re this report lays out in real time. My presentation will be the, the general findings of the report, which of course don't uh, have that, uh, that current situation included. There's some material on, on COVID, which of course also adds to the humanitarian challenges this year. Uh, but we can go uh, into further discussion on some of the, the current events in the Q&A if, uh, if you're interested in those. I'll give a very brief snapshot, but you were already given the link to the full report. Uh, I will be uh, skipping through some, some of the material. Uh, it's, it's super rich, so I recommend the full report or the executive summary, which is quite digestible, but it gives you all the, the hard-hitting facts that uh, will be useful, hopefully, also in further discussions elsewhere. So without further ado, um, basically the report tells you that the climate crisis also is already here. I remember when I started working on climate change in humanitarian uh, affairs or even more generally in development uh, at that time in the World Bank, and I was actually working in the Pacific Islands region at the time. Um, it was really strange to people that we were starting to talk about climate change as a current risk and something that had to do with development and, and humanitarian issues. People still thought about climate change as a question is the science clear about uh, what greenhouse gases are doing to the atmosphere? And then how much might we have to reduce that in order to say, save the polar bears in the Arctic in 2100? By now, it's very clear that we're talking about a here and now issue and that it very much affects humanitarian uh, work, that it affects justice, it affects development. So we'll uh, be presenting a few of the trends that we're seeing already in disasters and some of the, uh, the events that illustrate that. Uh, but then we'll primarily talk about what we need to do differently, and that is focused um, on uh, humanitarian and development work and, and actually really applies to the work of the IFRC and, and the Global Red Cross Arquesta Network itself. So we've asked ourselves the question, also in light of the very strong mandate that we've been given last year in the International Conference of the Red Cross uh, by the whole Red Cross Arquesta movement and its leaderships, but also by states, um, so what is it that we need to do differently to tackle the climate crisis? And one key aspect there is, of course, partnerships with governments, but with many other organizations as well. Um, so to some extent, this also provides our, our rallying call, I guess, to, to ourselves, to our global network, but also to all the partners we work with. So um, I mentioned already, it's very clear to everyone the climate crisis is already here. Um, the bushfires in Australia, I think, were at the start of the year uh, a very strong reminder to the rest of the world as well. 
Uh, also an illustration, of course, that it's never climate change alone. Uh, we have by now been able to point the finger at uh, a climate signal also in those push bushfires. But in many cases, of course, it's a combination of factors where climate change is just adding to the risk. Now, if you look at the overall disaster statistics, um, this was, uh, these were the numbers from last year. And uh, what we're seeing is, first of all, still massive impacts. So 100 million people affected. Um, 308 disasters will be counted last year. And the vast majority of those are climate and weather related. Uh, and if you look at numbers of people affected, then that, that percentage is even higher. And um, maybe, I think a little bit encouragingly, sadly in a way, um, that uh, 25,000 people were killed. Sounds like little, maybe also compared to COVID. It is partly also uh, attributable to an, an immense effort to reduce disaster mortality over the past decades. So as we stress concerns about where we are today, I think we also need to celebrate some successes, including, for instance, the improvement in early warning systems and evacuation of people. And um, Cyclone Amphan this year, for instance, in Bangladesh and India was a case in point with millions of people evacuated. Uh, but then a, a record strong storm that in the 1970s would have killed hundreds of thousands of people and now resulted in about 120 casualties. So there is, in a way, some good news in these numbers as well, although, of course, the human toll is, is high. The second message I wanted to convey strongly here is that while, uh, and I'll come to that later, vulnerability is, of course, much higher in the poorer places, everyone gets hit and gets hit also by the rising risks. And the Australian bushfires were one example. The top mortality uh, case last year in the statistics in 2019 was a European heat wave. So again, it's, it's risks that also some of those European countries don't consider as a problem normally, and also may not be a problem for most of the population. A nice day at the beach is what they would call it in the Netherlands. But still also in the Netherlands itself, last year, 400 people killed. And this year, again, in August, the heat wave killed 650 people in my country. If those had been people killed by a flood, it would have been an outrage. Um, now, if you look at uh, this year, I already mentioned, we have continued to see big disaster events and we're in the middle of a couple of, a couple of them right now. These were the figures until uh, 15 uh, September. Uh, and again, already 100 disasters occurring at the same time as the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I remember at the time, um, the storms in Vanuatu and um, uh, Solomon Islands were one of the first where we were confronted with having to do an evacuation while we were also uh, in a social distancing uh, situation. Uh, Amphan, that I mentioned before, was probably the biggest one this year. Uh, it's posing additional challenges to humanitarian response and, and to preparedness and evacuations. It is, of course, also uh, adding a double stress to the people affected in, in socioeconomic terms. Uh, and we're seeing that, for instance, with food security in, in Africa. So these are not two separate crises. They are closely connected. If you look at uh, the longer time scale, uh, the number of weather uh, and climate related disasters has been on the increase. Um, this, this is a 35% increase since the 1990s. That is the time that, that we think our statistics are pretty reliable, at least for the bigger uh, weather extremes, such as storms, floods, droughts. Um, I should say that there are still things missing from these numbers. And the heat waves that I mentioned uh, that are killers in Australia, but also in Europe and the United States, are often not even counted in developing countries, even though in the places where we are starting to count them, uh, they do turn out to be really big killers, like in a number of cities in India that are now paying attention to this. Um, so uh, it's, it's a massive toll, uh, 1.7 billion people affected the last decade, uh, and these numbers are rising. Um, now, of course, again, it's partly climate change. We know a number of these weather events are getting more intense. Uh, we're also getting more surprises around the world. Of course, it's also the way we, we develop and the way we live, uh, concentration of people and assets in vulnerable places. So the key message here is also that we're not yet uh, on track to manage the, the rising risks and that there's a lot we can do. Um, we're not just at the, at, the, at the mercy of all these climate events. Uh, and I'll come to what those next steps imply in a minute. So tomorrow is bound to be worse. Um, I. I again, want to emphasize that what happens to these projections of people affected is strongly determined on how we develop. Um, we did ourselves uh, with the IFRC last year a report called The Cost of Doing Nothing, where we were estimating future humanitarian needs in a changing climate. Due to climate change, those needs would go up. Uh, but it will very strongly depend, for instance, on what happens with extreme poverty. So if we manage to stay on track on the sustainable development goals and manage to integrate risk management 
in how we develop, we can keep these numbers down. Um, so that is maybe the, the most important underlying message we, we saw in our projections of future humanitarian needs that it depends as much on the climate as on how we develop and how we manage risk. Um, at the same time, I want to emphasize that, that risk management is already more complicated now and it will continue to get worse. Um, I should also emphasize that this is almost regardless of the climate change scenarios we'll be in, at least for the coming decade or two. Uh, what happens the second half of the century depends strongly on what we do on reducing greenhouse gas emissions now, but what we face the coming 10 years is essentially already baked in due to the greenhouse gases that have been emitted in the past. So we are in for a challenging um, decade for sure, but probably a, a challenging number of decades to come. Now, importantly, and I was already hinting at this, um, risk is not just determined by the hazards. It's not just, and, and you are all professionals in this field, so you, you know this better than anyone else. It's not just the weather extreme, the extreme amount of rainfall, the, the, the intense wind, uh, the drought that is, that is affecting people. It is, it is whether there are people or assets in, in the way of, of that hazard, but then also the vulnerability of those systems. And we're seeing that time and time again, also with the current storms, with people that have good housing, um, well, I wouldn't say hardly affected, but um, able to get through easily. But people in, in urban slums, for instance, uh, disproportionately affected. And then, of course, it's the capacity to manage that risk as well. So it's all these other factors in the way that we should be concentrating on. And it also shows the disproportionate impact on some groups, children and youth, urban poor, indigenous groups, older people, people with disabilities, role of gender, of course, very important uh, determinant for both vulnerability to risks, but also capacities to manage risk. I want to emphasize that this is not just about um, the, um, the victimization of certain groups. Uh, it's also that there may be solutions to risk management in, in, um, uh, in the future. Uh, and of course, migrants and displaced persons. And we saw some of those challenges in Bangladesh, for, for instance, with the Rohingya um, migrants there. So what do we need to do differently? Um, there are, uh, of course, challenges that are that are so related to how we have constructed our society so far and how we will construct our societies going forward. Uh, one important element is uh, maybe not something that, that we as a, a traditional humanitarian organization would do on our own, uh, but that is very much about how we do development. We're building cities at record speed. We're, we're constructing new infrastructure. Let's do it in a way that protects us from future risks rather than creates future risks. Critically, it's not just going to be these large scale infrastructural solutions. A lot of it needs to be done locally in communities uh, by local actors. Local authorities need to play a much, much smarter role, a bigger role. And then adopting climate smart programming. And again, this is not just about separate climate change adaptation programs to do something for that little increase in risk due to climate change, but it is increasing an in awareness of how risks are changing in lots of different uh, areas of work, not just disaster management, but also in for instance, water and sanitation, in uh, health and care programming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, I want to single out one element, uh, nature-based solutions. Um, what we're seeing in some cases is that um, infrastructure uh, is deployed quickly to protect against disaster risks. So for instance, um, I, I know of a case in the Sahel where the city of St. Louis is uh, being protected from increasing uh, risk due to rising sea levels and storms and storm surges. Um, by building a seawall uh, close to the central business district. Probably a good investment from an economic perspective. And in fact, the World Bank is, is supporting that investment. But it destabilizes pieces of the coast further down, where um, we knew that uh, actually the people reliant on humanitarian support were, uh, were living on sandbanks and were already getting more exposed to the sea level rise and are actually affected worse by uh, the type of solution used for the protection of the, the city of St. Louis. If you have mixed solutions, nature-based solutions um, in particular, where we deploy traditional methods of, of coastal protection, for instance, you can often avoid some of those, um, some of those side effects. And the same may be true for um, rivers. In the Netherlands, actually, my own country, we're a delta, so we're at risk of some of these, these impacts. And we've decided to make more room for the river rather than just build more dikes. A very important piece is also just accepting that the weather is becoming more volatile, but we can see it coming at shorter timescales. So uh, I mentioned the success story in a way of um, the evacuations that we've seen also this year. Further investments in anticipation are critical. And importantly, that's about saving people's lives, but also saving people's livelihoods. 
So one thing we're implementing increasingly in the Red Cross at Crescent, uh, but also with many other humanitarian organizations now, is something called forecast-based financing, where instead of supporting people after the fact to pick up their lives again, we're supporting them beforehand uh, with a, a either cash uh, so that they can take their own action or pre-planned early actions by, uh, in this case, the, the National Red Cross or Red Crescent Societies in particular. Um, an example would be someone in Bangladesh who might be reliant on uh, support from the Red Cross after a disaster, now get support beforehand to transport uh, a cow, for instance, that is their source of livelihood, to higher ground and, and buy a bit of fodder, rather than have to sell it before a storm um, because it would not survive uh, while the family is in a shelter. Um, I will hurry up, Fiona. I see you're turning on your camera. There's just a little bit, little bit oh. left. Um, one minute more. Um, a final thing, uh, we need to, to reduce our own environmental footprint, but also call on others. There is a long-term challenge if we do not manage to turn the, the, the curve here. So it's doing our own thing, but also having these discussions in our community and societies. And finally, risk governance. It is critical that this is integrated in legislation and there is a risk of, separate, of, of creating a separate climate silo that is creating its own policy mechanisms, its own legislation. Uh, and there are opportunities to, to link all these things better and have a bit better impact that way. The financing piece uh, is something I, I will leave for the discussion later on. But one thing is that it's clear that some of the most vulnerable populations are not getting the support they needed from the international climate, uh, climate support. And one of the questions is again, can we integrate better? I will leave it there, um, but summarize, I think, uh, our overall finding in this one slide. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks very much, uh, Martin, for um, the oversight um, of uh, the key findings of the report. Um, amazing amount of analysis on um, trends um, in climate and disasters. And even as I see those figures again, um, they're really, quite overwhelming. So it was also really good to hear from you some, you know, um, emerging positive examples around forecast based financing. Um, and also, you know, to hear such strong policy recommendations come out of this report. Um, now to move on and meet our other panelists and invite them um, to say a few words on the report and how climate and weather related disasters are impacting them in their countries and their regions. So as I mentioned earlier, um, on this panel, we have Michael O'Neill, who is the Director of International Programs and Movement Engagement at Australian Red Cross. Um, Michael has two decades of experience across the humanitarian and development fields in Africa and um, Asia Pacific. And in his current role um, as Director of International um, and Movement Relations at Australian Red Cross, Michael leads our own, Australian Red Cross's efforts to leverage Australia's resources to achieve collective humanitarian impact. We also have Le Mau. as I mentioned earlier, uh, Le Mau is currently based in, the, uh, in Palau, um, in the North Pacific Office of the International Federation of the Red Cross. Um, Palau, uh, Le Mau has a, a enormous, amazing experience in disaster management um, across the Pacific. I mean, I, I recall her work in Samoa and Tonga and Fiji, and is also the first female disaster management officer for the Red Cross in the Pacific. I did not know, know that, Le Mau. that's fabulous. Uh, Viviana um, has been working with the Red Cross in Timor-Leste for 10 years in her current role um, as coordinator for external relations. Viviana oversights proposals for donors and partners and in that role has a strong uh, relationship and collaboration with other government department ministries in Timor-Leste. And Emidia has also been working with Timor-Leste Red Cross for more than 10 years, um, most recently as disaster risk manager, where she provides technical support and capacity building to all staff and also works with other disaster management organisations and government institutions across Timor List. So each of the panellists will now take a few minutes to reflect on the report, uh, talk to their experience in their context, and then um, we'll open up for broader questions. So I might just hand over to you first, uh, Michael. Thank you, Fiona, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Martin has outlined, this is report and data clearly shows that our climate and weather are driving the occurrence and severity of disasters. And in our, re our region, we're really bearing the blunt of this globally, where 46% of all disasters in the past decade have been located in, in Asia, with 110 events occurring across the Pacific. 
We will see in our region more intense storms, uh, tropical storms, more heat waves, breaking temperature records and extreme waves and surge events that will have a devastating impact on people and communities we are already working with and ones that we will need to be working with into the future. Um, and this importantly is not a future threat as we have touched on today, in the past month, the Philippines uh, has experienced its strongest typhoon since Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, and some of the worst flooding in 45 years in parts of its country. So concerningly, the report really highlights uh, there is a growing gap between the increasing needs and the international and national response capacities that we will need to collectively come together. And it is clear as a sector we must do more. However, the challenges we face, um, again, cannot be done in isolation, but must be done through partnerships and integrating the way in which we can all make contributions to those communities and people that are vulnerable. Uh, it is critical that in doing so that we really do scale up our work um, and that we integrate our developmental activities across our risk reduction and climate adaptation work and especially with the focus at the local level, um, both within the local authorities and within the community level um, in the communities that we work with. We must support and empower the local leadership of civil society and communities in this area to lead the contextualization and implementation of national disaster plans and policies, which is seen as being key to increasing local capacity to manage more complex shocks that will result due to the multiplying effects of climate change and the shortening cycles, allowing less time for recovery and preparedness, which will eventually whittle away the resilience that we have built up over the past years. We must seriously scale up our investment in disaster risk reduction and resilience to match these new threats and integrate anticipatory approaches, including the forecast-based financing that Martin has mentioned, so that people can receive assistance ahead of predictable shocks um, that we're able to uh, forecast more accurately today. And finally, we must speed up the reorientation of our investments in response to risk reduction and adaptation and from the national to the local level. The report outlines an investment of 50 billion US dollars per year for the next decade could meet the adaptation requirements for the 50 developing countries over the next decade. Placing this into perspective, the total financial impact of climate and weather related disasters globally over the past 10 years is estimated to be as high as 1.92 trillion US dollars. So in closing, simply, this is a good financial investment that importantly saves lives and strengthens the resilience of vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thanks very much for uh, those insights, Michael. Um, I might head now to um, the Pacific and to Lamau. Are you able to turn on your com uh, camera there, Lamau? Yeah. Thanks, Fiona. I think uh, Professor Martin and Michael Lanier had already provided the facts of what the report says. Um, and from a Pacific Island nation, uh, 10 years ago, uh, trying to find the information uh, to contribute to this was not available. Um, you know, we had to be uh, scraping the, the barrel to, to look for the, the information. But I think uh, as the years have uh, gone past, the, the, the value and the, the Pacific contribution to the World Disaster Report has increased dramatically because of the realization that it's in their front door and it's the reality that they live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and in saying that, what Michael O'Neill had alluded to earlier in investing, um, I think the Pacific is also waking up to the fact that they have to diversify how this investments that is being poured into the Pacific to do uh, community resilience, disaster risk reduction and disaster uh, risk management developments in the Pacific. Uh, so the in the region, um, it's increasing the momentum. Uh, it's also increasing the, the investments into the information management, as well as articulating what the what the Pacific is doing and, and, and uh, the translation of what the World Disaster Report means to their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And if 
I was to look at it from when I first joined the Red Cross and uh, in the Pacific, uh, when, when we see this, it's just a, another report that is put on the shelf. It's no longer that case today. Um, six years from when I first started with the Red Cross, um, you know, the disaster report has become our Bible and it's something that we reference when we speak about the climate change impacts, when we speak to get the awareness of the community. Uh, we use the facts that are available on the report to kind of lure the attention in and we have been doing that successfully in the Pacific using what's been available for us in, um, through the disaster report. Thanks so much, um, Lamau. Um, we'll come back to some of those really critical points you made around the Pacific experience um, of disasters and, and, and the importance of the data that's provided um, in this report. I'll just um, head over now to Timor Leste and to Vidiana and Emidia. Um, if you wanted to give um, some reflections on your experience of uh, climate related disasters um, and, and have a um, uh, National, Red Cross National Society in Timor Leste is um, addressing them. Uh, thank you. As, uh, from Timor Leste, as you know, that Timor Leste is a young country and we have a small scale disaster with multiple types of hazards such as flood, uh, drought, uh, landslide, high wind, fire, as well as the social conflict. And uh, based on this uh, World Disaster Report, as noted last year, that Timor Leste also has gone through a complicated period of triple natural disasters with a simultaneous uh, occurrence of a strong wind, fire, and flooding throughout the territory. So starting with a fire that occurred in one of the municipality nearby uh, capital of Dili, Likisa, which uh, was uh, spread to the neighbor uh, municipality in Ermera with uh, consequences more of the loss of the uh, material. And um, uh, through this report, we saw that the climate-induced disaster, uh, Timor-Leste Red Cross also already uh, part of the National Climate Change Working Group in national level, which is uh, in last year, uh, the Timor-Leste Red Cross also already presented our climate change activities that we implemented through the integrated community-based risk reduction program in all territory in Timor-Leste. So uh, we already implemented what our successful in implemented climate uh, uh, induced disaster as well as the uh, other other uh, community based project uh, like uh, health and uh, nutrition water and sanitation as well as livelihood program and uh, through this uh, conference uh, we found that uh, from uh, they asked uh, Timor Lester Red Cross to to submit our proposal to have funding through the Green Climate Fund. So I think this is that um, uh, we already submitted our proposal and uh, at the moment we uh, CVTL also already implement climate change activities that align with our uh, strategic plan. So we already include this implement under the integrated community-based uh, uh, program. Uh, and then uh, just uh, three years ago, uh, Timor-Leste also faced the El Nino and uh, from that uh, Timor-Leste Red Cross, we already implement caste-based inter intervention as well as the nutrition program and health and hygiene promotion activities to the people affected, especially in the east part of Timor-Leste. Uh, I think uh, that's all from my side. Maybe I will hand, hand over to Mana Vidiana to, to add more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, as my colleague Lemidia is a disaster management coordinator, has mentioned about the situation uh, in Timor relating with the disaster. Uh, from our side, that as we know that uh, how uh, from the organization uh, we can enhance and support uh, uh, the staff and volunteer to give more the capacity to them. Uh, as we know that Timor Leste is a young national society that need much support and uh, develop our uh, system in 
financial and other uh, area that's very important for Civitel. So uh, as the report has shown some, some of the action that we really need to be, uh, we really need to consider in the national society, like uh, how to implementing our forecast-based financing. So this is really important. So how this will be come up from the our governing board together with the executive uh, to discuss and in our uh, Civitel, we will have our uh, financial support for emergency response. And then how we can strengthen more our capacity volunteer uh, in order uh, in the community level, how we can uh, support them to support also for the uh, disaster happen in the country. And through that, we, we, we always uh, consider also our benchmark and indicator from our pair assessment that we notice that some of the benchmark uh, uh, the National Society not, not uh, achieved, we try to put in our action plan uh, in order to, to make sure that we have uh, the, doing some action uh, with the team uh, for better management on the uh, risk. Okay, and, thank you, Chlamydia. I might just have to jump in there so we leave a bit more space for questions. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting to hear from both of you about the approach of um, the Red Cross in Timor-Leste, about the integration of climate change across, across your work, and very interesting that you've also submitted that uh, proposal into the Green Climate Fund. Um, so, just uh, uh, so thank you to all of the speakers and so that ends um, the presentations and I ask those of you on the call to uh, start uh, posting questions um, to the panel. Um, as I said, uh, a very diverse and experienced group of practitioners in this area. Um, I might jump in first and pose a question to you, uh, Martin, as I know that um, there's a lot of people on this call um, from the development, uh, humanitarian and, and climate communities. And the report does talk a lot about uh, how you get to how these different sectors can talk more and collaborate more, you know, across climate science, the environmentalists, development practitioners, etc. But I'm interested in what do you think are the main challenges or obstacles that are actually preventing this collaboration? Um, and where do you actually then see you know, good opportunities um, for greater collaboration or examples of this of where this is already happening? Thanks, Fiona. Um, yeah, this, this is really still an obstacle. And, and I think one reason is uh, a bit what I said in the beginning of my presentation, that the climate world has come from a very sort of environmental management framework, uh, often in, in many countries sit, uh, still sit in environment ministries that, uh, that may sometimes even compete for attention with uh, national disaster management agencies, for instance. The Pacific actually has an integrated disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation framework, so that helps a lot. And you see that integration happening in more and more countries. Uh, but often the institutions are, are still siloed. Also in uh, development and humanitarian agencies, sometimes climate is, is still segmented as a separate thing. And the financing is siloed. Now, the encouraging news, I think, is that that is starting to change. So what you see is uh, humanitarian agencies also getting more engaged uh, in uh, in understanding and addressing climate risks. You also see the climate change world looking at humanitarian agencies and development agencies to really help them come to grips with some of the challenges. Um, so for instance, this, uh, this example of forecast-based financing that came up in several of our presentations is something that the Green Climate Fund now also understands is a key component of adaptation to climate change. So when they are now supporting national meteorological and hydrological services, they are thinking about how can we also invest in the last mile? And how can we enable these early action systems to be coupled to our investments that come from a more climate oriented perspective? So um, I think the, 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 the door is open for a much closer collaboration, but it requires uh, collaboration on, on the part of all of us. Thanks, Martin. That's um, really important messages for all of us to hear. Um, I might now um, hand, uh, hand over to Lamau with a question around some of the findings from the report, you know, really talk to um, the projected increases in and impacts on tropical cyclones, which of course has a very big impact in the Pacific. Um, 
Lamal, with this you know, projection around the increased frequency and impact of Category 4 and, and 5 cyclones, how are you actually seeing um, the work around disaster management, disaster preparedness uh, change in the Pacific? And what, what sorts of changes in particular in community adaptation measures are you starting to see? That was for you, Lamal. Yeah, thanks. thanks for your question, Fiona. Um, I think apart from the, the intensity and the numbers increasing for uh, the, the, the Pacific, the reality in the Pacific has changed as well, that it's no longer just the, uh, the, the traditional uh, April to November kind of season or May to October season in, in the different parts of the Pacific. It has uh, definitely increased um, you, you know, the, the traditional cycles or the seasons have changed and we are seeing more and more also the, the, the patterns of uh, the cyclones happening outside of those traditional seasons. And with that, uh, the, the Red Cross have to ensure that they adapt uh, also to the trends and the changes that are happening around the world. Um, and the changes and community adaptation measures that the Red Cross is supporting uh, in their own countries streams from strengthening community early warning systems. And, and this is really to go down to the level where the community uh, ensure that they are understanding the bullet. Um, ensure that they're understanding the bulletin and uh, translating that technological um, bulletins that they're receiving with the collaboration between themselves and the weather services and the MIT services and really uh, articulating how they can pre-prepare uh, themselves before the actual impact. So talking about what uh, Professor Martin was talking about earlier, the early actions. Um, and with that, really working with the communities to look at their local risks analysis and identifying how they themselves can prepare or adapt uh, to the changes in the environment and, and the climate. And I think the last thing that I wanna, because of time, um, I, I wanna speak about the integrated approach that Michael and Nia as well as uh, Martin has spoken about. Although that the policy level is opening up as Martin had said, the, some of the tools and the techniques that the Red Cross had invested uh, for over a number of years in the community level adaptation program has been successful. And uh, I think one of the key things that the Red Cross is doing in the Pacific is to revisiting those tools and reintegrating uh, the, the sectorial approaches. So it's no longer just about the disaster management program dealing with disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness, but getting the health practitioners, getting the financial, getting the private sector, getting everybody on the table and having that discussion so that when they go into the community, the community are asking the right questions and that they have a, a space where all of these sectors are producing or pro uh, promoting how the communities can integrate uh, or holistically approach these um, disaster uh, community adaptation measures. So I think I'll stop there and then we can revisit some of these things uh, yeah. later on. Great, thanks Thanks um, for that, Lamau. Um, again, a couple of uh, key, key threads, key themes coming through in, in, in these discussions. Um, one of the points I might pick up on was you mentioned Lamau um, early warning, early action, and we've heard a bit from uh, Martin about uh, the work around anticipatory action in Bangladesh, and Michael also mentioned forecast-based action. So this is actually a question uh, to Michael. Um, as we're hearing about this move to anticipatory action, anticipatory finance, are you starting to see some shifts in Australia um, around approaches to financing disasters? Um, and any moves in particular from the private sector. Thank you, Fiona. So yes, um, I think uh, building on that 
uh, really traditional approach and the good work that's been done in early warning, we've been trying to really promote how we can actually leverage that further to take that one step and, and look at in, encouraging actions that can be taken that complement the early warning messages. But we do need resources to be able to do that. And those resources that are provided immediately before a disaster can have a major impact on people reducing the, the damage to their, um, to their livelihoods, the damage to their, their stock, for example, um, or their homes where they can board up. So how do we finance that? There's a, there's a lot of interest um, and recent interest in regard to um, insurance-based security products. Um, and we see out of um, uh, Denmark that there's been an establishment of a, a volcanic cat catastrophic bond that has been able to uh, pull together resources that can be dispersed based on the triggers of uh, the eruption level of a volcano. We're looking at seeing how that can be taken forward here within the Pacific, particularly around cyclone events um, and really leveraging that advances in uh, forecasting of cyclone and weather events as well as uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to set predictive levels for triggers that we can then um, embrace uh, insurance-based products to invest in those early actions that, that have a huge impact immediately provided to a disaster, but also on the resilience of communities as they can then um, recover stronger. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, and I've been um, alerted by ACFED that Jason um, has raised his hand to ask a question. So uh, Jason, I might just uh, throw over to you uh, to pose that question to the panel. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so very, uh, very much, uh, Fiona, appreciate it. And uh, I think uh, first, maybe just as an introduction, um, I'm a director at DFAT uh, covering um, humanitarian Pacific partnerships and, and planning. Um, so I specifically look after the um, AHP partnership and the ARC um, relationship, um, but more specifically deal with regional engagement um, and also um, strategy planning and analysis um, in the Pacific. Um, but I don't specifically just work in the Pacific. Um, uh, the AHP partnership does uh, have a global reach and we work in protracted crises as well. Um, uh, so look, just very quickly, I'd just like to thank the panel, um, uh, uh, Martin, Michael, uh, Lamar, uh, Vidiana and Namidia. Uh, and, and just very briefly, I think um, the, the panel, the, the breadth of the panel, the depth of the panel showed the, the global to local reach and, and the concerns. Um, overall, it's a stark reality that we're facing. And I think um, the report um, and the presentation shows that. And I think that's um, uh, 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 whilst concerning, uh, uh, it's a reality check for, for all of us. Um, uh, coming from the humanitarian sector, um, I hear especially what uh, Martin and Michael were saying uh, about um, the, the, um, uh, the actions that, that need to be taken um, from uh, organisations that are working in that, in that space. But also note um, one of the themes that, that's coming out here that I'm noting is, is the soloing between not only humanitarian development, and we, we in, in, in our sector, we talk about that a lot, and it has different names, and I'd prefer to call it a continuum, but noting also the, the soloing within the climate sector itself and the need to break out of that. Um, one of the things that um, both Lamau and Vidiana and Amidia's presentation gave me was um, the links to localization as well. Um, and uh, how we need to have um, some, some uh, uh, local solutions to some of these issues that start off at grassroots level, but obviously must link in at government level as well. And that's, that's local government, that's country level, uh, that's regional level. And also that comes to, to donor level in other countries as well. And that's of course where, where Australia comes in. Um, my question I think um, goes to probably um, Michael, um, but possibly Martin um, and anyone else who, who may have input um, in that uh, I'm just wondering about um, uh, uh, the, the, the Federation's experiences and maybe specifically uh, Australian Red, Red Cross's experience in this space in that um, the Red Cross works a lot uh, across a lot of these areas. Australian Red Cross uh, works with national societies in disaster response and humanitarian in resilience and preparedness, but also in development, works with government, clearly works in climate, um, works in areas such as disaster law, as some of the, um, the interesting conversations that, that, that I've had with, um, with um, Red Cross colleagues. Are there any learnings that we as humanitarians in the humanitarian space uh, can learn from ARC um, in the de-siloing of our work 
to be able to, to make um, this you know, stark reality, as I said, more accessible, more digestible, more understandable, uh, and, and ultimately uh, 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 potentially be able to deal with it a lot easier by de -soloing. Is there anything that we can take away from um, the Red Cross's experience uh, today? Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, that's a great question. And uh, so pleased to have uh, DFAT on, uh, on the call. Um, I'll throw that open. Well, actually, um, Michael, um, certainly from that Australian perspective, did you want to have uh, a go at answering that question from Jason? And then I might ask Martin as well. Yep. Uh, thank you, Fiona. And thank you, Jason. And um, honestly, I don't think there is one uh, answer that can, can meet the challenge that you've outlined there. Um, but what I would say is that I mean, that challenge we pose to ourselves internally within the Red Cross um, very much. And it's one of those questions that we at Australian Red Cross want to keep it front and centre of mind. And if I use one of the examples about, um, we've spoken about a lot, lot today about anticipatory action. So anticipatory action is a great tool that could be beneficial for any one organisation uh, or any one community. But what we uh, are seeking to do is to make sure that it's not siloed within a, a particular organisation or institution. So while we are trying to really show how uh, you can get runs on the board and the impact of anticipatory action through forecast based financing, and we set up global procedures and processes and we have re resources through our global disaster relief emergency fund to do that. The real uh, impact of this will only be when it starts to get picked up by institutions and across all organisations in a country. So a couple of years ago, um, yeah, across the Pacific, we were supporting a study and we worked together with FAO, particularly in Solomon Islands, in which we were looking to unpack the potential to establish um, forecast based action product um, for drought. Um, and, and that has had some progress moving forward. But within that, we approach this from not just, is it the Red Cross and FAO who could set this up so that it's the Red Cross and the FAO that had access to resources. Our approach was to work with um, the, the government of Solomon Islands, to work with the National Disaster Management Office, to work with the IFRC was a key provider in their technical advice, but to work with um, the agricultural ministry, to work with the climate meteorological uh, organisations, to bring it as a, a whole of uh, sector, a whole of country approach, so that what was developed was not something for Red Cross alone, but was for the country. And as it got rolled out and as it got picked up, it might be that the Red Cross would not be involved in some responses, but the benefit was a contribution to the whole society from that initiative. And I think that's one example to sort of show that unless you have that mindset entering into these, these types of discussions, to address the challenges that are integrated across everything that we do. And Martin also mentioned earlier about the impact of poverty and how that can inform the, the increasing needs that we have earlier on. Unless you're able to have those conversations and bring those people from government, from local community, from civil society, from scientific based organisations into the conversation, we're never going to be able to have a chance to address that challenge that you've laid out there, Jason. But I don't think one way is going to be able to do it. We have to have it as a mindset. It's got to be in many ways a cultural change that we embed in our behaviours and our ways of working rather than a, this is what, a way to do it. And that's what I would share from our experiences um, of working with our partners and being guided by our partners, honestly, um, in a lot of this, Mark, uh, Jason. Thanks, thanks, Michael. It's um, yeah, very interesting to hear um, that emphasis on you know, uh, behavioural change and cultural change. I might actually ask Lamau to continue that conversation because actually in the Pacific, I do think you see a very advanced uh, approach around this very question. Um, a lot of effort's gone into uh, bringing those sectors together, uh, particularly around the framework for resilient development. Um, so Lamau, could you say a few words about your experience and the Pacific experience on bringing you know, these different sectors into the conversation? Yeah. I think Jason is well aware of how all of those uh, work, but I just want to highlight the fact that uh, the Red Cross in the Pacific has moved away. Uh, again, I I, uh, I speak on uh, the, from the Federation point of view on how the Red Cross has moved away from um, the particular uh, silo services that they provide, but more so uh, listening and uh, developing 
being open minded to what the need is. So basing their uh, response and de siloing the, you know, the approach to where the mandated role was in the first place and really listening to what the need is based on the trends of the, the climate changes as well as the, uh, uh, the, the, the reality that is happening around them. Um, so one of them is using the roadmap for resilience as uh, Fiona had uh, spoken to. And this is something that is not well recognized within the sectorial uh, approaches, but it's well integrated into the national society and the local actors. So we're using the Pacific Resilience Roadmap as well as the strategy to really uh, empower the, 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 the local national societies within the Pacific to say, uh, these are what the policy levels are saying, um, but also this is what you can contribute to it as, as a body and as a network of uh, people who are working from the grassroots level. The localization of the approach as well is quite something that we speak uh, naturally about in the Pacific nowadays compared to a couple of years ago. And thanks to the, the, the groundwork that uh, Australia and DFAT as well as the Australian Red Cross have contributed to in the previous years and is uh, uh, continuing to support. Um, the localization does not really uh, speak in, in, in fancy or flowery terms. It's actually grounded. Um, and COVID-19 has proven that that localization is the way to go. And it's the approach that should have been uh, used years and years ago. And meaning that when we say local actors, we're actually talking not just from the national level, but we're talking to community existing mechanism um, about how they can uh, approach their own uh, vulnerabilities and risks. Um, and I think those are the two things that we have uh, learned or relearned over and over and over again as a Pacific region. And definitely from an, from an International Federation perspective, it's two of the most uh, powerful tools that we can actually tap into to continue the work as humanitarian actors. Um, fabulous. Thanks for that um, input, uh, Lamau. Um, I'm going to draw on a question from Peter Walton. Um, and in doing so, I'm also um, requesting uh, your indulgence to uh, allow the session to go over <laughs> for another five minutes. I think we're always wildly ambitious around how we can contain these conversations into one hour. So Peter's really spoken about um, the disproportional impact of climate change on women and the impact that on inclusion and leadership. It's, it's a question that I'm going to put to um, uh, CBTL, Team or Leste Red Cross. Um, and Vidiana and Emidia, the uh, Red Cross and Team or Leste has you know, had a really strong history of community volunteering and community engagement, um, you know, very strong focus on uh, you know, community-based resilient activities. From your perspective, could you actually talk a bit more about um, who do you think uh, are most vulnerable to increased disasters and climate re related hazards? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the question. So uh, from our perspective, uh, from our perspective on this question, uh, we notice that the people that live in the more vulnerable uh, in remote areas, uh, they are vulnerable to the disaster. So, uh, but we also consider uh, that our program that we are integrated with the, uh, our youth program. Uh, so we try also to do the some of the prevention action like uh, integrated with the youth school safety, how we can also uh, give the uh, information to the, our student in the school and also children and also uh, 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 how they can also uh, prevent and how they can more safety uh, while they are doing their activities. So we are considered uh, also how our response into the diversity group with the mother and children and also people with disability uh, in all of the response uh, to the disaster. And we, uh, through our uh, integrated community-based risk reduction project, uh, we all noticed that the information that uh, we 
identify and then we get the information. The, we hear more from the local community, uh, how we can together with them uh, to better response on disaster. So we more also looking how we can support uh, 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 to empower our existing group like uh, uh, National Disaster Response Team and Branch Disaster Response Team uh, together response in a good way uh, for the disaster. And uh, through that, uh, we also uh, make sure that uh, we get a lot of the support for our family movement members from other national society. Uh, also to get some of the support in terms of the funding and then research technical support uh, for our national society. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for that. Um, unfortunately, I think I am going to have to uh, draw this uh, part of the conversation to a close. Um, it has been um, terrific to hear from all of our panellists. And I'll just recap with some of the key messages that I've heard throughout the session. I mean, first and foremost, um, climate and weather related disasters uh, are causing escalating humanitarian impacts. Um, Martin spoke to this uh, very forcefully at the that the climate crisis is with us now and the impacts tomorrow are going to be even worse. Um, we just heard then from uh, Timor Leste Red Cross that those most at risk are those all, um, are already vulnerable, you know, such as the elderly migrants, women headed households. Um, but this manifests in different ways and that women um, can also be agents of change in the solutions uh, to uh, um, this climate crisis. Um, this, this broader impact on um, disadvantaged groups and those that are uh, most uh, difficult to access really means that governments and institutional agencies need to prioritise their investments and assistance in ways that are very practically targeting disadvantaged and, and hard to reach groups. Um, we've heard uh, quite a lot of discussion about bridging the silos between our sectors um, and the need for this change to be at the institutional level, to be at the policy level, and also to be at the behavioural and, and cultural level. We've heard from a number of speakers about the importance of localisation um, and a key uh, issue around um, the response and, and greater investment in preparedness is to really support and empower local leadership. Um, we've heard quite a lot around data science and improving forecast based actions. Um, and a bit from the mail though, that even the most uh, significant, sophisticated technology um, won't matter unless we can communicate and engage communities um, in the solutions. And finally, we need a shift from a reactive approach to one that invests in anticipatory action and anticipatory finance and at scale and unites the various funding windows. Um, so thanks very much to all of our panelists for their, um, for their great presentations and uh, responses to the questions. Um, again, a, a great thanks to uh, Martin um, for dialing in so early uh, from the Netherlands, to Michael and Nier in Australia, to Le Mans, uh, in the Pacific, and to Vidiana and the media, it was wonderful to hear from you all. Also a big thank you to ACFID for uh, enabling this session on their digital platform. And to all of the participants, thank you for your engagement. Um, in closing, I really do want to emphasize, you know, this is such a critical and timely issue that we can't lose sight of um, within um, a lot of other uh, crises happening. Um, and to say that this report, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a dense report, it's a big report, there's been a lot of data and analytics into it. Um, so I urge you to use it and to bring it into your conversations. And as the report says, the time for action is now. Um, we can, we, and collectively, we can actually all act to reduce the impact of climate change on disasters. So that's it. Uh, once again, thanks. And please do get in touch with us at the Australian Red Cross if you've got any further questions or want to discuss this report or findings um, further. Um, good afternoon and thanks again to everyone.